Hello, um, I am Gabby Williams. I'm co-chair of the World Affairs Series. Um, our speaker tonight is Yale economist and co-author of More Than Good Intentions, Improving the Way the World's Poor Borrow, Save, Farm, Learn, and Stay Healthy. As a development economist, he uses insights from behavioral and experimental economics in his emerging field of study that investigates how psychological barriers and emotional factors can lead to irrational choices in the decision-making process. Much of his research is focused on microfinance, and he is the founder and president of Innovation for Poverty, or of Poverty Action. His work to improve the financial case capabilities of low and moderate income individuals around the world has been funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as City Foundation. So please, it is an honor to welcome Dean Carlin. Hi everyone, it's a real pleasure to be here today with all of you, um, and um, my understanding is I will talk for a bunch and then we'll have Q&A, but, um, but actually I'm happy to be informal, so if someone wants to jump in and ask a question and something I'm saying in particular, just feel free to raise your hand and I'm happy to stop. So the, there's one word in there I want you to notice, um, and I'll talk more about it in a bit, and it's the word helping. Um, not solving. Um, and we actually had to fight with our publisher at first. The entire book that we wrote is about figuring out what works and what doesn't. And one of the themes, they always wanted to push us, like, what's the, okay, great, give us the great big idea. And we're like, you know, it's, that's not, there isn't a silver bullet then. But that's a hard thesis for a book, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't sell to the media quite so well, but yet that's in some sense one of the theses of the book or, and all of the work. And so we actually had to fight to kind of tone down the, the, the post-colon part of the book um, to not claim to be solving problems, but instead to claim to be helping to solve problems or helping to mitigate and to lower, to improve the situation, but not to eliminate the problem altogether. And that, in, in a sense, is what we mean by pragmatic optimism, what I mean by pragmatic optimism in the title, which is, we're optimistic. There's lots of great things that we can do. There's a lot of changes that we can make happen. And sometimes it doesn't actually require that much in the way of resources. But we also have to be pragmatic. And it takes more than just a, a, good, a good idea or a seemingly good idea to make a difference. So we have to be pragmatic. We need to get data. We need to find out what's working um, and, and, and move ahead. OK. So there's an analogy. Oops, that did not change for your screen. And I guess it doesn't really matter on mine. Hold on a second. How do we do this? No. Nope. Hmm. There we go. Now it didn't change on my screen. Give me a second. Oh yeah, it did. Okay. There's a, a philosopher who I am a huge admirer of. He's one of my, I, I consider myself a fan, um, Peter Singer. And he tells the following analogy. Suppose you're walking down the street and there's a lake there's a child drowning in the lake. And you're on your way to a meeting. Pretend whatever you want this meeting is for, but you're going to make $500 in this meeting. Okay? And if you miss the meeting, you will lose the $500. Maybe you have to pay $500. Let's, let's even make it simpler. Let's say if you don't go to this meeting, you, have to, you owe someone $500 for whatever reason. Okay? And there's a child drowning. Now, you have a clear choice. Do you jump in the lake and save this child's life, um, miss your meeting and owe $500, or do you march ahead and go to your meeting? Now, if I ask you to raise your hands, in most settings, I won't do it here, I don't want to, but in most settings, 90%, 95%, sometimes even 100%, if I make you do it and look around each other, then we'll get to 100% pretty quickly. We'll say, of course, I'm going to skip out and I'm going to pay the $500 for this meeting and go save this child's life. So the, as the analogy continues, okay, well, immunizing children from many, child, from many diseases will save a life. Uh, you know, not every immunization will save a life, but if you spend $500 on immunizations, you'll save a life on average. So do we all have an ethical obligation right now to get out your checkbook? I can tell you the name of some organizations you can send the money to, and $500 will pay for 
more immunizations for children. Um, raise your hand if you think you have an ethical obligation. You don't have to do it, but trust me, if we did, you know, some of you would raise your hand, but everyone's going to get a little squeamish and be like, eh, you know, for some... And, and there's, so why are these different? Now, there's two sets of reasons why they're different, these two, these two things I just posed to you. One is a set of things that are about psychology and how psychology influences our perception of ethics and norms and what's right and wrong. And the other is analytical, which is just about trade-offs. As a, in a, in analytical in this sense, I'm using that synonymously as an economist view of the world. It's about trade-offs, $500, child's life, there you go, it's the same answer. So let's, I'm going to ignore the psychological stuff, but there's all sorts of reasons why we, are, we, we do treat them differently, about we can see the child, I can't see the child in Africa, I can see, or Asia, or wherever, I can see the child in like, so there's all sorts of psychological reasons, but let's not go there, that's not what I'm interested in, we could, we could talk forever about those. Let's talk about the analytical differences. There's really only one. The only analytical difference is, you know you can save that child in the lake, but how do you know when, if I told you the name of some organization that's working in a developing country, and you might say to me, okay, I get it, the brochure says they're going to do this, but how do I know that that's really going to work? How do I know they're choosing good ideas, they're implementing them well, there's so much uncertainty there, how do I really know? Okay, so I'm going to do two things. One is the rest of the talk, which is all about, in some, evaluation. It's all about learning what works and what doesn't, to remove that uncertainty, to make it so that that trade-off between those two is not so stark. That yes, it's certain in the lake you know you can save the child, but uh, you know, I can, what I can do is I can, with, with better data and better evidence, we can remove some of that uncertainty. We're not going to take it to zero. We're not going to remove all uncertainty, but we can certainly make the odds better that you can choose organizations well that are making an impact. But before I get there, I'm going to do one thing just to wreak havoc with your with, with, your, with the difference between these two questions, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to twist the lake question around on you for a second and say, suppose you can't swim, but there's a lifesaver on the other side of the lake. So what you can do, you can walk all the way around the lake, get that lifesaver, throw it into the lake, hope you hit the kid, well, not like on the head, but like near the kid, right? So the kid can, get, can be saved. But now, what I've done here is I've made that a probabilistic event. You may or may not successfully throw that lifesaver. And so now it's the same thing as sending money to Village Reach, working in Mozambique to immunize children. You, it may or may not save a child, you're not quite sure. Both of them now have that level of uncertainty. Yet it's still the case, if I asked you to raise your hands, or in any sort of, I just presented both, and I didn't even explain the analytics, I just presented both. I guarantee you, much, many more people would say, I have an ethical obligation to throw that lifesaver, but I don't have the ethical obligation to send the money. Okay. Um, so back to the, to the main, the main point, though, is about using evidence to remove that uncertainty. And the two goals for doing that is because there's altruistic skeptics out there in the world. These are people who, do, who are driven by that humanitarian desire to help others, but are skeptical that the things that are out there for them to do actually work. And so one goal of, this, of everything I'm going to tell you about today is about helping to inspire those altruistic skeptics to be a little bit less skeptical, to find things that do have stronger evidence. The second is to take the believers, the people who are already acting, who are already either committed in their own profession, their own time, or committed in terms of their money, and, and helping them just do better. Helping them direct their resources, whether it be their money or their time, towards ideas that have stronger evidence. And that's the overall goal of all of the, the work I'm telling you about. Okay. So let's talk about some of the, the questions that, are, that, we, that we often are faced with, and which ones are kind of the right questions and the wrong questions to ask. So the first question on here is, does aid work? This is a very common question. I get this a lot. It's a wrong question. There is no answer to that question. Certainly not monosyllabic, yes or no. Right? But it's also just not the case that there's an answer. I mean, you know, the answer or the, or the other way of saying it is the answer is really obvious and it's in the middle. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So it's kind of silly to just have this kind of grandiose from the clouds conversation about whether aid works and whether corruption distorts things. Because obviously there's going to be some cases where it's good and sometimes where it's bad, and we have to get down to the bottom 
to the ground and answer the second question. And that's something that we can really get our head around. Does this program over here work? That we can do. Right? And that's what, that's what I'm going to give you examples of are times where we say, look, we're not answering the grand question about the aid budget of the United States and how much good it's doing. But I can tell you that this program over here that was doing this had the following impact. So with that, too, a good question to ask is why this program works. Right? If you don't have an understanding of why something works, then it's very hard to take lessons from that, stu from that setting and go somewhere else and figure out what to do. So you always want to ask why something works. That's a much harder question to get at. You have to have some theory as to what's going on, why this was needed, what, what, was, what was the problem in the first place, and how this solved it. And I'll go through some examples of that. But that's, that third question is exactly what leads you to the fourth, which is, will that program over there likely work? Right? And in some sense, that's what we're going for. That's the ultimate question we care about, and that's why we ask the second and the third. So the, so the, the punchline here, by the way, is the first question's bad, and the second, third, and fourth are good. But they're asked in that order. Does it work? Over here. Why? And now, given that I know it worked over here, and I know why it worked, I can go somewhere else with some sort of understanding of the theory as to why something's working, and then, and then make prescriptions in a new setting uh, that might be different, but is similar enough in the, cont in the ways that matter. Okay. So I am an economist. So I start off everything in life by assuming markets work. That's what economists do, right? It is perfect information in the world. We all are well informed. And there's zero transaction costs, the two most critical assumptions that markets work. And when that's the case, just let markets work, let people make trades, and the world's a great place. Except when they do not. Right? And that's the heart of what we do when we are looking at economic solutions to public policy problems. We start off assuming that they work. And we don't actually believe that in most cases. Many, some do. Many don't. But the challenge is not to just, you know, we don't start off by assuming it's broken. We start off by assuming it's right and trying to figure out where it went wrong. So let me give you um, a, a, a specific example in a second. But breaking this down into, a very, very th into three questions, and actually, when I teach undergraduates, they, I, I open up every lecture with these three questions. And now, actually, towards the end of the semester, I, I, it's like a chant. The, uh, I make the students recite the questions back to me. And we just change the topic. It's education, it's health, it's finance, whatever it is, but it's the same three questions. What is the market failure? Why are we talking about this from a public policy perspective? Why aren't we just letting markets work? So was there some problem where you couldn't write a contract because you couldn't enforce it? Was there a problem that you just didn't have the right information? Some parties were, were, didn't, didn't have sufficient market information about prices, and this, made, this created a problem for them to be able to have transactions. Then we want to talk about a specific policy. This might be a public policy from the government. It might be an NGO doing charity work. It might be a for-profit business. But we want to know, does whatever it is that is being done differently, does it actually solve that market failure? And the third question is, who cares? What's the welfare gain? Because at the end of the day, if I'm on the donor side of things, I'm choosing, if I'm Bill Gates, I'm choosing with lots of zeros. But if I'm not Bill Gates, I'm just choosing with fewer zeros. And I have trade-offs to make. And I want to know, where is, am I getting the most bang for my buck? Because right? I can solve problems that don't actually matter that much. And I can solve some problems that matter a lot. So it's not enough to just know that I solved the problem. I want to know how much better people are for it. And that's the third question. So let me give you an example of this type of thinking. Cows. So cows in India, 45% of Indian households own at least one cow or one buffalo. So huge proportion. We did some just um, very detailed surveying of, of households, asking them about every single cash flow related to the cow, including the value of the cow, the, the fodder costs, the milk produced, the, the, the everything, everything we could think of, everything that was there. We calculated. If you count the, include their time it takes to deal with the cow, the returns to cows was negative 64%. The returns to buffalo, negative 40%. If we assume that household labor is zero, the cost of household labor is zero, it's another way of saying that is they have no other option for making money. Right? There's no market wage that they could be out, and so their market wage is zero, which is a really stark assumption. 
That's what it takes, though, to get that number to be positive. So this leads us to one of my favorite articles from The Onion. You guys familiar with The Onion? It's a satire magazine. And they have this great title called Continued Existence of Edible Arrangements Disproves Central Tenets of Capitalism. Has anybody here ever bought anything from edible arrangements? Do you guys have edible arrangements in Iowa? No? Do you, do you know what this is? Raise your hand if you know what edible arrangements is. Okay. Raise your hand if you don't know what it is. Okay, so that's enough. Let me explain it. It's basically it's that. <laughs> that's what it is. They sell, think of it like a floral shop, but instead of floral, instead of flowers, they'll sell you cut up fruit. Okay, but you know, it's already cut up, so it's not gonna stay fresh that long. Right. So my apologies if anybody thinks it's a good idea and has bought it and likes it, but the, the, the joke here from The Onion is that this is a horrible, horrible product that only irrational people would ever buy. <laughs> and so this business cannot possibly be making any money because how can a business make money by selling something that, only, that, that no one rational would ever buy? Okay, and so they make, and one of the central tenets of capitalism is that if a firm is running, is, is losing money, that it'll go out of business, and bad ideas go out of business, right? And so the, the idea is continued existence of edible arrangements disproves one of two central tenets. Either firms that lose money can manage to stay in business somehow, or people aren't rational. One of the two has to be wrong. So. So the, the title of this project is the, central, the Continued Existence of Cows Disproves Central Tenets of Capitalism. Right, because here we have these cows, 45% of Indian households own them. According to our calculations, they're losing 64% a year. Now, something's wrong, obviously, to be clear. Right, I'm not actually putting this, right? So the point is, now we know there's, a, there's some problem somewhere. Something's wrong, so what is it? And that's where we start off. We start off with this puzzle and we try to figure it out. So the first option could be that our data are wrong. Let's just not go there. It could be right, and we talk about it more in our research. But you know, um, but let's thinking through what could be other issues that might be causing this. One is there might be a, pro a problem in the milk market. There's a might you might have a preference for milk that comes out of your own cow. Now it's probably not a taste thing. It's not literally that you just kind of have an affinity for your cow's milk. I don't know, you guys probably know far more about this than I do. Um, um, but what it could be is that you don't trust milk bought from a market because there is no regulatory body in Indian markets that is making sure that the milk that is sold into a market is not adulterated, is not watered down, and, and, worse, and then worse yet, if it's watered down, watered down with unclean water. Right? And so there isn't a good regulatory process for this. And so what that means is that you actually do prefer your own milk for your own cow. And so what that also means is that when we are looking at the value of the milk, we're using market prices, but it's actually worth more to you because it's worth, because it's your own milk. So that would explain perhaps our negative. But that tells us there's a market failure here in milk, right? And there might be an interesting innovation here about third-party verification um, of milk. And there might actually be a good business process innovation or a government role for regulating milk that can help improve the milk market and allow it so that people can actually sell their milk and get more money, and then that would be, that would be good. It could be that people actually like, they, they're willing to lose money on a cow because of, it's a way of stashing money away. If I put money in my pocket, well, it can burn a hole in my pocket and I'll spend it on frivolous things, but I can't sell a quarter of my cow when I'm tempted by something I want to buy. So if I buy a cow, it's a way of locking my money away from myself. It's in the cow, fig figuratively speaking, right? And so that, that tells us, if that's the reason we're doing it, and it could be right, maybe we are actually losing money on cows, but we're doing it because it keeps money away from us for something in the future that we can then sell the cow at some point. But that tells us that there's a problem in the savings market and something's going on that banks are not offering the right service because that's, that's a service a bank should be willing to offer where you don't have to pay negative 64% in order to have a savings account. You should be able to just put it in a savings account and maybe earn zero at best, right? Okay, so, and there's other possibilities, but this is, this is the way we think about these things, is to start off with a problem, try to understand where the market flaw is, and then think through what could be possible solutions. So microcredit is a good example of a um, innovation which has really taken Sprout all over the world, and it's, fundamentally started by looking and seeing that there's a basic problem, that the banks were not lending 
to individuals. Individuals had ideas, had things they wanted to do that required money that would make them more money. And banks were not lending to them. So there was the market problem. And there was a business process innovation that went to look and figure out how to go about giving people access to credit. And it started about 40 years ago, and now we see microfinance institutions all over the world making small loans, often usually to women, to either help start or to grow very, very small enterprises. Now, I first got involved in microcredit in 1992, and I was in El Salvador, and the, the organization I was working with, um, you know, it was before the internet day, so I didn't know what the interest rates were, and when I got down there, I was actually fairly surprised that the interest rates were as high as they were, because I, I thought of this as a charity, and I was coming from, you know, U.S. markets, where I think of 18% as a high interest rate on a loan. And, um, and the interest rate was 72%. And this was a nonprofit, and you can get a tax deduction from supporting them. But I was really, you know, surprised. Now, it's not hard on a, to think through what someone is doing to get a return that exceeds 72%. But what really struck me was, well, if that's what you're lending at, what is the impact of this thing? Like, your, your basic premise to me was that you're giving people loans to help them start up small business so they can earn money and then grow and have more income for health and education of their children. But if you're lending at 72%, you must have a return that's higher than 72% in order for this to really be about income. Is that really the case? Is this really about creating an income generating activity? So where's your impact study? So they showed me their impact studies and it included asking their clients you're older than you were, I'm sorry, let me, let, me, let me back up one second. There's one other important detail about what they do, which is most microcredit organizations are very, um, make a big deal about choosing entrepreneurial women, right? They're not just lending to anybody. They're lending to people who are trying to fight their way out of poverty, who are very enterprising, have good ideas that just need funding. So they showed me their surveys and their impact studies, and it consisted of asking people in the program, are you eating better than you were two years ago? Are you healthier than you were two years ago? Is your business bigger now than it was before? And they got huge pluses. Everyone was saying yes, this is great. 90% 90, 90 mo or more were saying yes to all these questions. So they didn't ask, there's this fourth question that would have been funny if they asked, but they didn't, which was, are you older than you were two years ago? So if they did that, right, their logic on the first three was that you know, they made a loan to someone and they, their business got bigger and so they caused that to happen. So if they ask the aging question, can you picture the headline of the impact study, microcredit causes aging, right? Because everyone would have said, yes, I'm older than I was two years ago. So the point is, you have, to have, you have to have some understanding as to what would have happened to these people had they not gotten a loan, right? You can't just say like some sort of before-after story and say, ah, this is because of the loan. Maybe, maybe macroeconomic conditions were good, maybe they were bad. Maybe there was some other program going on in the community that was handing out money to people and doing something else that helped increase income. So it, it's just, it's rule number one of empirical analysis that correlation is not causation. So this is my favorite comic strip on this regard. Um, I'll let you read it and absorb it. Um, and so this is particularly true in this case of microcredit. Like I said, these. I backed up for a second because I forgot to tell you that tidbit about choosing hardworking, enterprising women. What do you think happens to hardworking, enterprising women compared to women who are not hardworking and not enterprising? Who does better over time? The ones who are hardworking and enterprising. It's kind of what we mean by it. So, so even if we were to compare changes in people's lives from the, the people who join the program to the people who don't, even without, the, we, we, we already kind of said that we expect the people who join the program to do better over time because of them being hardworking and enterprising. So we have to do something better than just comparing them to somebody else. So when we think about the impact question, sorry, if I can up, what we're really asking when we want to know, does something work, is how have the lives of people in a program changed compared to how they would have been in the program's absence? So the first part of that is fairly straightforward, right? You can follow some people over time and find out how their lives changed. But the point is that doesn't tell you the impact. You have to know what would have happened had the program not existed. So that's a hypothetical question. In econ jargon, we call that the counterfactual, or social science jargon. It's the counterfactual. It's what would have happened, right? And, and that requires 
some way of either having a time machine where you go back in time and you don't do the program and then you see what happens and then you compare the two, but uh, until someone invents the time machine, we'll get to that later, I have a slide about that in a, in a bit. You can't, you know, you have to come up with some way. And this is why, in a in, say, in, say we were all doing medical research, there's a way we would, we take it totally for granted. When you take a prescription drug, these prescription drugs have gone through randomized trials. And it's done exactly for this reason, where some people got the drug and some people got a placebo and they were followed over time by the doctors, found out the results, this happens a few times, the FDA regulates this whole process before a drug can be approved to be used um, for all of us in whatever our elements are. And we're taking that same exact approach to the fight against poverty. So we go into these, go into areas and we set up a randomized trial. And that way we know from the people who receive either an alternative service or, or whatever it is, we are able to compare two groups and, and say what exactly, we, we randomize what the difference is and what the two groups get, and then we can compare over time how lives are changed. And that's the heart of what everything I'm gonna present to you from here forward are the results of that type of rigorous study. But this was not done 10 plus years ago. It was very, very rare to see this type of research done um, uh, to help understand what was happening in, in these programs. Okay, so back to microcredit. One of the things that's striking to me about microcredit is it reminds me of, there's a, another fun cartoon, um, How Masochists Shower. And this is basically the story of microcredit. Um, think about it as the idiot in the shower problem. So the idiot in the shower problem is the, is the, you know, the person who gets in and it's too hot and then swings it cold, or the masochist in the shower who just keeps swinging it back and forth from one side to the other. And that's basically what we've seen happen in microcredit. I have these great quotes. Um, so 2006, for starters, no, microcredit won the Nobel Peace Prize. Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for what they started. And then in 2010, we started seeing tons of backlash. In, in India, it started, Bolivia, Mexico, huge controversies over people getting too much credit and, and also controversies over the interest rates. And, and the media was just swinging wet, wildly from left to right about whether microcredit was good or actually not just not good, but actually bad. So there's now been about uh, six studies that have come out on microcredit. Uh, the, the newest one we're releasing in a month, which is of, the, of Comportamos, which is the largest microcredit lender to actually do an IPO, go public as a for-profit company for $1.5 billion. So they're very controversial because they started off as a nonprofit and then got really rich. The striking thing is all six of these studies are showing very similar results of basically mediocre, mo mediocre impact, not, no, no big impacts on income, just like, um, you know, for reasons that are fairly intuitive. If you're gonna lend at 72%, how much money can you possibly be making off of that? But there are some important and positive impacts. People are able to manage risk better. They are actually expanding their businesses some, so you are seeing more stability. So there's some important impacts, but they're nothing that we should be throwing donor money at but it's something that we can feel good from an investor perspective, that these are banks that are getting people access to credit, that are making them better off, um, and making the world a better place in that regard. But it's just not, the, the, the evidence does not support using donor money to, to further it. The irony too is there is one study that actually found a positive impact. Um, it was actually the one that had the most expensive loans at 200% APR in South Africa. It was more like payday lending in the United States. And it was actually the only one that actually had uh, a large impact to increase income and lower the poverty headcount ratio. And the reason was it was done to people who had, it was loans offered to people who had jobs and basically they were borrowing at a moment of crisis and even though these were really expensive, getting access to those loans allowed them to keep their jobs. The difference between being employed and unemployed is the difference between being poor and not poor. And so that's why that, that particular lender was ironically the one that's hated most among all the ones that have had a good clean evaluation in the kind of microcredit community because they're the least like the do-gooder microcredit groups that raise money, raise, raise donor money, but they actually had the biggest positive impact on income. Having said that, savings results, which I'm gonna spend most of the rest of the talk on, have had much more positive results overall and certainly much less controversy since it doesn't, um, there's no interest rate um, kind of controversy around it. But I first want to take a deviation because of the, the risk um, issue that I mentioned. So one of the biggest impacts it has been on risk that we've seen. 
And so it should make you ask, okay, so if risk is why people are borrowing, why not give them insurance, right? Isn't that what risk, isn't that what we're supposed to deal with risk? And so then you might want to think, okay, what are the problems in insurance markets? Well, there's all sorts of reasons why insurance markets are difficult to, to manage in a developing country in particular. So we did a study on um, rainfall insurance in, in Ghana. And we did two things. We set this up as a randomized trial, as I mentioned, but we had four groups. We had a bunch of farmers that got free rainfall insurance. The reason for rainfall insurance is simple, which is that we can't do crop insurance, and then there's a risk that, that if you insure the crop, that the farmer doesn't put in effort to de-weed and do all the things, right? And so the nice thing about rainfall insurance is it's an index, it's based off of a rainfall monitor, and it's gonna pay out or not, irrespective of what the farmer does. So, so there's one group of farmers that just got that. And there's another group of farmers that we just gave them money. Literally, we just gave them money, about $250. So the point is, if the, if, the, if the credit constraint is stopping them from making investments, well, let's give them some money. Let's see what they do. Then we had a third group where we gave them both. The idea was maybe the risk is making them too nervous to invest, and they don't even have the money, so even if, they didn't, even if, they, even if we solve the risk problem, it doesn't help because they don't have the money. So we have to give them both, and then they'll invest. And then there was a fourth group that was a control. So what we find was that when we gave them rainfall insurance and no money, they still invested a lot more money in fertilizer, expanded their farm to fallow land, to, and, the, and they started cultivating it. They hired people. So the striking thing here is how much risk mattered, and also how when we took the risk away from rainfall, they did manage to come up with money somehow. So it says that they weren't nearly as credit constrained as we thought they were or the conventional wisdom is. So so much of agricultural policy in developing countries is focused on getting people access to credit. And this says that actually risk is, a, is really more of the driving issue. If we gave them money, just to be clear, they did invest some of it too. But they invested just as much when we gave them the free rainfall insurance. Um, but there have been, there are some issues with how to do this market. Uh, and one is trust, right? How do people, do people trust the insurance company? We found that when you, if you got lucky one year, lucky, by, by lucky I mean got a payout, so you got unlucky in rainfall, lucky in the payout, the next year you were more likely to buy the rainfall insurance. If you got rainfall insurance but did not get a payout, so you had decent rain, you were less likely to buy the next year. So this tells us the trust, both a combination of trust, which is created when you make the payouts, and also what we call recency bias, which is I, when I think about, hmm, am I, do I want to get this insurance, I think about what happened last year, and that really is a big driver of my decision of whether to insure this year. So this is one of my favorite photos. This is um, Hakeem, who's uh, one of our employees at Innovations for Poverty Action. Innovations for Poverty Action is the nonprofit that was mentioned earlier that I started that does a lot of the field work, both on implementation and research. So this is him. This is the face of trust, basically. This is him making a delivery of cash, in that bag is a bunch of money, to farmers in the middle of a flood, because it paid out for flood or drought. Um, so this is how you create trust, but the point is it's not always so easy to do. Okay, so, so the rest of the examples I'm gonna give you are about savings. The other lesson from microfinance is that, is that we can do a lot of good by helping people accumulate savings Think back to that cow and that story I told you about how you, people want to get money out of their pockets and into something that they can't touch. And so that's what we mean by a commitment savings account. It's com your money is committed to something. It's in some way. You're either committing to put money into it to not take it out. And so we've seen a few different examples of people doing this. The first one that I did is a, we titled the paper Tying Odysseus to the Mast after the story about Odysseus who really wanted to hear the, the song of the sirens, but, but the, if he heard them, um, he would steer the ship and crash into the rocks. So he tied himself to the mast so that he could then listen to the sirens without being tempted by their, by their song. And that's basically the heart of what we've been testing is a few different ways of doing this type of savings account. Now, the, one, of the, one of the themes that we have here, referred to this as the limbo game, we wanted to see how low can we go? How little do we have to do in the way of structuring a savings product to make it work better than just a regular account. So the first iteration we did was in the Philippines where we locked the money up until they reached a goal. So that was a pretty strict commitment device in the sense that they just couldn't get their money. If they, if they brought in a doctor's note, just to be clear, they could get their money. If they moved, they were able to get their money. And if they died, 
someone else could come in and get their money. Um, but that only happened once. Someone pulled, in, pulled out money for medical. But for anything else, you could not touch your money until you reach your goal. And, and so the idea is there's no reason why, there was no compensation for this, right? You just tie up your money. So anybody perfectly rational would never want to do that. You're just removing some future choices. Why, why would you restrict your future choices? But people wanted that. 28% of the people offered this account and said yes. And their savings went up by 300%. And it led the women to have more power over decisions in the household about what was spent. So it was great. So the next one was done by other researchers, done through IPA, but it was not my personal research. And they took, we gave people a box in the Philippines. In this study, they just tested the box. And they just gave people this box, and you see there's like a little thing for a lock, and the bank had the lock. And that was it. That was the whole device. So you put money in this little box. And this led to increase in health savings by 66%, and changes in actually health outcomes once they had more money in health. So this is really simple. So then we got even simpler. We tested in Uganda an education account. We gave, we gave children uh, and their families the opportunity to save into, into an account. And we had two different treatment groups. We had one treatment group where the money they put into this account was locked into had to be spent on education expenses, textbooks, pens, papers, things like that. The other group, it wasn't locked in. And it was cash. It was volunt but they, when, they, when they made the withdrawal, they were given cash. They weren't given a voucher that had to be used on education expenses. They were just given cash. But right then and there in that same spot, when they got the cash, was also a little booth set up, a table set up, where they could buy the pens and papers and stuff like that. So it was totally voluntary, but it was made really easy. So that when they got the cash, there's the stuff to buy. No one wanted the one that was restrictive. The more restrictive one didn't work very well. People didn't use it as much, and it had no positive impacts. The one that was voluntary was used a lot more, and we actually saw an 8% increase in test scores, which is a huge increase in test scores just from offering kids a little savings account. So it was a very promising study, I think. I like to think. But it's a one that also shows that there's somewhere in, you know, we don't want to be, the minute you're too restrictive and you tie your hands too much, that's maybe too much. And so we have to try to figure out where to strike that balance. So then we took it down, um, taking it down a notch, there was a study done in, in Malawi. This one's not by me, but also by, I, by other researchers at IPA. Here, they offered farmers a commitment savings account. It was very much inspired from a different study that did a similar work where it offered fertilizer vouchers and found that committing to buy fertilizer increased the purchase of fertilizer. So they offered a commitment account. At harvest time, you put money into an account, and that money gets locked in, and you can only pull it out at planting season, where you then need that for buying inputs for your farm. And household, it had a huge impact on household expenditures because they, they bought more fertilizer, they bought more inputs, ha and household expenditures went up by 17% a year later as a result of getting access to this account. But here's the funny part about the study. No one put money into the account. So it had this impact, right? But, it, but people didn't actually use it. They put money into their other account, their fully liquid account. So you, we offered them this commitment savings account, and it changed their lives. But they didn't use it, they used the other account. So what this tells us, potentially, is that what we did is we, we got it into their mind that you, know, you ought to save now for later, but they didn't actually need the rules to do that. It was all psychological. Okay, So that's where we go. We take it down a notch. So this is the limbo game. We're taking it down a notch. Here, all we did is label accounts. There's no rules whatsoever. We took a bunch of people who have savings accounts, and we offered them a second account, half of them. Half of them stay with their normal account, and half of them get a second bank account. And there's no rule whatsoever. All that happened was we put a name on it. So we, you tell us, what, is, what are you saving for? Health, great, here's a health account. Education, health, business, or other. Those were their four options. Savings are up 16 to 30%, just by being given a second account. Right? And so now it's the same exact process. Someone comes through once a week, it takes your savings deposits, both treatment and control group, but when you have the two accounts, you end up saving more with this label. So we're now in the field trying to find out whether when you put more in and you have an education account, you actually spend more money on education. So we'll find out about that. So, so this is, these are all the different projects in, um, on savings. We're pretty spread out now. And one of the themes to IPA is about replication, is about seeing that we can't just test an idea once and then run, to the, run, run it um, everywhere. We have to find out under what context is this going to work, how pervasive are the, are the lessons that we're learning. 
So one theme here, to tie this back to those three questions I posed, sometimes when we talk about market failures, we're not talking about markets in the traditional sense. We're actually potentially sometimes talking about behavioral failures within ourselves, and that's valid as a market failure. Right? It, it, it's not a market failure where in a tr the traditional market failure is I, I want to make you a loan, you want to borrow from me, but I can't trust you to repay, and so I don't give you a loan. That's a market failure. Right? But this type of behavioral failure comes from things like what I'm describing about temptation, where you, I, I want to write a contract with my future self so that my future self doesn't eat dessert at dinner. But I have a hard time doing that, particularly after I've had a bottle of wine. Right? So this is one reason why oftentimes if I go to a restaurant with friends, I will tell them, if I order dessert, I owe you $200. Then I don't eat dessert, because right? I don't care if I've had a bottle of wine, I'm not going to spend $210 on dessert. Right? And so I just wrote a contract with my future self in that sense to, in order to, to kind of rein in my temptations. Um, and so that's the spirit in which that these behavioral issues about how we actually behave still applies to the market failures. So what we're seeing in, in the world of behavioral economics is what we've, I think is kind of correct to describe as behavioral economics 2.0. The first 10, 20 years of behavioral economics was all about documenting these kind of anomalous behaviors that we all engage in that are deviations from traditional economic models. But the fun part that we're now engaged in is this, or I, I mean, I wasn't here for the first phase, is, okay, how do we actually use this stuff to change products? So all these examples of savings products are behavioral economics 2.0. We understand people have temptation problems. We understand that psychological labels and barriers might actually have big influences on behavior. Let's use these ideas to change the way we design products and policies. Um, and that's, that's what we're involved in. So one of the things that I did on this that was fine, that was a little bit of a, project on the side was I started a company called Stick. Um, and Stick is a place you can go and you can write a contract to commit your future self to certain behavior, just like Odysseus. So you can, you, you basically set a goal. You want to, the most popular ones are losing weight and stopping smoking or exercising more. You name a referee, this is the person who can adjudicate whether you succeed or failed. And you set stakes. You can set no stakes, then it's purely psychological. Or you can put money online. You can put $1,000 on the line or $10,000 on the line or $100 or $2. And then you also name people who get informed if you succeed or fail, because maybe your reputation is, all the, is really the most important thing. So you just name five people who are going to get an email if you succeed or fail. And um, the most popular options on the money side are the anti-charities. These are charities that you hate. And so we gave people both sides of hot political issues. Uh, the, like, and the George W. Bush Presidential Library, I think, has um, always been the um, the most favorite, although there's nothing, we, we're not, you know, we, we have no bias about it. We give left and right sides of everything. That's always been the most popular option, though. Um, so a few of the ones that are kind of fun, just to, as a little aside, because um, you can also write in whatever, whatever it is that you want to commit to not doing. So we have one person who wrote a contract to speak more slowly to foreigners in New York City. Um, someone who said, no more dating losers, and named a friend to be the referee. Someone else who said, wake up every day by 8 a.m. And the last one I put in here from my daughter, Gabby, over here. This is the contract I'm trying to get her to write, and it says, no more fighting with my sister. Um, so um, a few more comments on, on behavioral economics. One is, it's, it's striking. You can't just ask people what you're going to do. This is one of, the, one of the main lessons of economics and doing field work. Doesn't, you know, you can hold a focus group and you can get completely the wrong answer. Suppose we held a focus group on loans and we asked people, what really matters to you? What's, what is the most important characteristics on a loan? What are people going to tell us? They're going to tell us the price, how much I can borrow, how long I have to repay, how frequently I have to repay. These are the things they're going to tell us. So we did an experiment where we sent off mailers. Um, lots of different things were randomized across mailers, um, testing out what people really cared about on the loan. By, and the measure, the outcome measure is which one works to get people to borrow. So their interest rates were different. The amounts they could borrow were different. But let's focus on interest rates and, um, and let's focus on whether there is a woman on the bottom right corner. So what we found was these were, these were the loans in South Africa at the lender who was lending at 200% APR. What we found was that we could lower, if we lowered interest rates by a third, on men, when men got a solicitation, if we lowered by interest rates by a third, it was just as effective as getting them to borrow 
as adding a photo of a woman. Okay, that's 60% a year in terms of the annual cost that they're willing to just be like, yeah, all the same, 60% on my loan or give me a little photo on the woman on the bottom right corner of my letter. I'm just as happy either way, just as likely to borrow. Right? You're not going to get that out of any focus group. You're not going to hold a focus group and ask people, rank, you know, tell us how much you care about whether there's a photo of a woman on the, your solicitation, and, and, and you know, that's not going to, so, okay, you get the point. Um, so here's, here's my closing thought for you on behavioral economics, applied behavioral economics. So, so there's two lessons from this, this photo. Here we got these guys going to get exercise, taking the escalator. There's two lessons. One is people are hard to predict, right? So, you know, we can say, oh, someone has a temptation problem. That doesn't mean every single thing they do in life is driven by a temptation problem, right? Oh, we can say someone's not paying attention to their finances and that's causing them to make mistakes. That doesn't mean they're never paying attention to their finances, right? And so, so it's not, it, it, we don't have, you know, we need models of people that are context specific. And there's certain contexts in which we behave one way and certain contexts in which we behave other ways. And, and understanding behavioral economics has to include something about those contexts in order to be able to understand how people are really going to behave in a given situation. The other is how easy it is to move people. There's, I, don't, I don't have it, um, it's, not, it's not really used, I, I need to get it better for, to be able to share, but we have a video in which we, um, we put a little sign up in front of that escalator that said two calories to the right and 25 calories to the left. And that got people taking the stairs, right? So that's a good example of a very simple nudge. That little thing just made people realize, yeah, that's right, I'm going to the gym. Why am I taking the escalator? And, um, and the numbers went radically shifted to be about half-half in terms of the numbers that were taking the stairs versus the escalator versus 90-10. Okay. So back to charity to close up. At the end of the day, what's the goal when we're looking at different organizations that are out there that are doing work in the, in the, to, to fight poverty? It's hard because I don't see it making the movement here. So I, okay, so our basic goal is to maximize aid effectiveness. Right? Get how much bang can you get for your buck? So in some cases, that's very expensive things that have huge impacts, but sometimes it's really, really cheap things that have big impacts too, right? It's just maybe the impact is smaller, but it's really, really cheap. So you can't just calculate the benefits of something, you have to know what it costs. What's the basic formula? There's a very simple formula to have, which is you wanna choose the best idea. So you wanna support organizations that are choosing good ideas. And you need to choose organizations that do what you say you will do, or they do it, I'm sorry, I said, my pronouns are off there. They do, they're doing what they say they will do. These are two very different things. Everything I've been telling you about so far is really about A, about ideas. And that's the space that I'm in personally, and, the, and a lot of researchers are in, is figuring out what ideas have solid ground to them and solid evidence behind them. And that's, that's the overall space of evaluation. The second thing, though, is important. And it's what we call monitoring. It's very different. And it's just, does, do they do what they say they're going to do? And there's many organizations out there that are, doing, um, that are doing good ideas and shouldn't be doing impact evaluations, but are pushed that way by donors. When what they should be doing is saying, look, what we're doing makes sense. It has evidence behind it. Go back to those very, very first slide I had or second slide I had with the four questions, right? So they, they're choosing an idea that's good. They understand why it works, and they're implementing it. Right? That's not a case where you need to be answering that counterfactual question and setting up big, fancy, randomized trials. That's a case where you just need to demonstrate we're choosing the right idea, the theory works in this context, and here is the monitoring data to show you that we told you we would be passing out bed nets, we're passing out bed nets, we told you we'd be immunizing children, and there you go, we are immunizing children. You don't need to go and run a test to see the impact of immunizing children. You need to just show us that you're doing it. And so the goal at the end of the day is to maximize A times B. Right? That's, that's the overall goal. Um, so now, just closing up, um, telling you a little bit about all of this research that I've been telling you about was set up, when I finished graduate school, one of the things, I, I told you a bit about how I got into what I was doing, it was working in, in microcredit 
and being struck by how we didn't really know what it was doing, what the impact was. But what struck me when I, got, when I was in graduate school was, okay, great, we have all these people that are really excited about doing research to help understand answers to these questions, but we don't have an organization that does two things. One is help with all that field work, because the reality is, as graduate students or professors, we're not really trained in doing field work. We're trained in theory and we're trained in analytics, but we're not trained in managing a team of 30 people asking door-to-door -door surveys. And so we needed a, an organization that was committed to doing that type of high-quality field work and helping to set up these types of randomized trials. But more importantly, we need an organization that wasn't academic, because I, responding to academic incentives, will do my research and move on to my next research project, and then my next research project, and why would I ever stop? That doesn't help me do things like get tenure, right? And so we needed an organization that was committed to taking the research that has clear prescriptions and taking it to the light of day and making sure that the right people got it, whether it's donors, investors, government, policymakers, whoever it is, and taking it to action, hence the term poverty action. So I started this in 2002. Basically, it was our address for the first couple of years was my home. We were fairly small, but we grew and grew and grew. And we're now in 45 countries with 14 country offices. This, we started in 2002. Um, we have 900 employees and about 150 researchers in our network doing, using us to do their research. So it's been, it's been absolutely exhilarating and the, the single smartest thing I did was about a year and a half ago and I stepped down as executive director and, we, um, and so now I am um, kind of founder and board member and I get to give talks like this but I don't have to do the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, and, and here's a map just to give you a sense of our global, global reach. Um, the different colors represent different sectors because we're across, because we are a consortium of researchers and so we work in many different areas, in microfinance, health, education, corruption, agriculture, etc. Okay, so here's my second favorite protest sign and then we're done. What do we want? This is, came from the, remember all those protests that were going around a, a couple years ago? Um, Evidence-based change. And when do we want it? After peer review. Okay, so since I put that up and I talked about time travel, I had to share with you my favorite protest sign, which is, what do we want? Time travel? When do we want it? It's irrelevant. <laughs> and that's all. Thank you. I was interested in your slide that showed what I would call mental accounting made a difference in saving rates. Do you see a correlation or any kind of association between mental accounting and risk tolerance as well? Um, I don't know. I haven't, we didn't, in that study I don't think we, um, I'd have to think about it, but I don't think we even collected data on risk tolerance, so I can't say from there. Um, I would say, I will make a general statement that risk tolerance is really hard to measure. Um, and I'm not so, I've done it, but I'm not so confident uh, that I've done it well. And, um, you know, there's a typical way of doing it is to ask people little questions like, would you prefer, you know, a dollar for sure, or flip a coin, heads for three, tails for nothing? Um, and, you know, there isn't too much research which finds that that type of question is correlated with things like taking on more risky crops, which is something I'd like to see happen. Like, I don't believe that measure if it doesn't predict what crops you grow, um, and things like that. So I, I'm not, um, I, I'm, I'm, I think we're still learning how to, how to do those measures in the field. Um, and some have. I mean, it's, it's not that we see none of it. I've seen some measures on ambiguity aversion, for instance. Ambiguity aversion is kind of like risk aversion, but it says I just don't like situations where I don't even know what the probabilities are. I can't, it's, it's an ambiguous situation and a little uncomfortable. And there's people who have more aversion or less aversion to such situations. And we have seen evidence that people who are more ambiguity averse in agriculture um, are less likely to take up new, 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 new things in agriculture. 
which is a very important result. On the um, question of, of sort of insurance and, and farmers um, having greater incentives to invest, I mean, to some extent, fertilizer is a way to add insurance on the, uh, against a, a crop failure, right? You're adding nutrients. Uh, to what extent would uh, sort of uh, just uh, education, right? The traditional extension. Are the farmers still resistant if they understand the technologies and understand the, uh, the advantages of the investments? Or, or do you really have to have sort of an a second market to make the uh, the outcome. Um, so, the most of the I'm, I haven't seen too many studies that just do extension work. Extension work being just informative. Um, so, but for the most, for the ones I have seen have not felt very promising. That that, that information alone is the barrier. Um, I I think the you know the fertilizer issue though. I mean, I, I think, I mean, there is an issue with, with respect to rainfall in particular that fertilizer exacerbates the risk because you put fertilizer in, if you have bad rainfall, it doesn't matter that you put fertilizer in, you're losing everything, and then you lose the money you spent on fertilizer. So, so it, it, on, and it, if the rainfall is good, then your income's even better, and if rainfall is bad, you lose it all. So, so fertilizer with respect to rain is risk, you know, adds to the risk, and that's, that's one of the reasons why we were looking so directly at fertilizer as the response to getting rainfall insurance, and that's and that's exactly what we did see is that that was the, one of the main inputs that went up um, was fertilizer after we gave away the rainfall insurance. Um, there have been um, we did do a study in Kenya that did do ag extension work, but it also hooked them up with markets. So it was getting them to switch to a a export crop, uh, either French beans or baby corn. And um, which were kind of grown a little bit. People were vaguely familiar with them, and some were more than others. So some people in our sample had actually grown them before, but most had not. Um, and this had actually really strong impacts on household income. And, but it did lots of things. It gave people credit for some to, to buy the inputs. It showed them how to grow the stuff. It showed them how to package it and harvest it. It showed them, it, and it introduced them to the exporter and basically coordinated the transaction with the exporter. And when it did everything all together, it worked. But it turns out, ironically, that when you offered them credit alongside everything, it did worse than when you did everything but without the credit. And the reason was simple. Because there was a market for this stuff. It just wasn't, the exporter was paying, let's say, $10. And if they didn't sell the exporter, they could sell it for um, 8 somewhere else. OK, so obviously, they prefer to sell it to the exporter for 10 than somewhere else for 8 unless they have to repay a loan of 3 so if they sold it through the organization that bundled everything together, the organization sold it for 10, paid off their loan of three, and handed them seven. Or they can side sell. Sell it for eight, renege on the loan. Turns out they preferred eight to seven. And so they reneged on the loan and side sold. And it killed the market, and it caused problems. Um, the exporters then also pulled out because of European regulations um, that they were doing as protection again for their farmers. So they were putting in all these kind of crazy rules that basically made it so that the French beans couldn't be imported to France. And the other part, which I never quite understood, was that in Kenya, um, the, we remember saying, well, worst case scenario, can't you just eat the French beans? I mean, they're French beans. And they looked at me like I was nuts. Like, why would you on earth would you ever eat these things? I wouldn't even feed it to our animals. And I was like, oh, they're, they're good. They're French beans. And they just, it was obviously one of these things that is a taste thing and they would never do, even though it was being exported to France and sold for decent money. But that killed the market um, for a year. And, um, but then eventually the exporters came back. It, did, it, did, it does have a nice epilogue at the end. But I mean, the, the punchline, though, is that it was more than just information. So I can't tell you that it wasn't the full package of stuff. I would first like to corroborate on your last point from uh, some experience that I have uh, back in India. Uh, that just the information is, if you even go to a farmer and say, uh, you know, I studied agriculture and this is good for you, they'll say, mm, generations after generations work like this. Who are you, a 20 year old, telling me what to do? They won't take that information. And in many cases, in developing countries, 
uh, people have gone to them and exploited them. So there's a huge trust deficit which you have to overcome. And uh, I have seen some organizations working who have, who spend years to overcome that trust deficit. I, I had one question for you, sir. Um, so you were speaking about uh, income from cows and uh, um, ab about that having negative returns. Uh, India went through uh, decades of what is known as the white revolution where uh, women uh, basically got cows and milked them as cooperatives and in increased their income. Uh, how is this sustainable with a 64% loss rate? And in most cases, it was never that the government gave them anything. It was mostly a cooperative saying, I can buy your milk. A few ladies, few entrepreneurial ladies said, okay, let's get a cow. And then other ladies saw, hey, that household is doing better and got another cow. So how, how do you correlate these uh, things? I mean, minus 64% if, 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 if that number is right, there's no way that this can be sustained over decades. That, that's the point. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> that, that is the point we're making. Something's wrong there. The numbers can't possibly be negative 64%. So that means that something's off in terms of the, the market for milk. Something's off in terms of the way we're valuing labor. Remember, it was positive if you value labor zero. So if there's no labor market, if the woman has no other outside option for jobs, then it's a positive return. But that's a really depressing story about the labor markets. Like, I don't think that's right. I don't think it's that extreme. I mean, I'm, labor markets are not good, but zero is, is a pretty, pretty stark assumption. So it could be that you add up a lot of these little things and you end up getting to a positive number. But, you're, but you, the premise is exactly, you're, you're, the question you're posing is exactly our question, which is, okay, what's wrong with this story? Because something is wrong. We know that it can't possibly be that something generates a 64% loss year in, year out, and yet 45% of households are doing it year in, year out for decades and decades and decades. That's obviously wrong. So then where's the flaw? And, and honestly, the answer could just be that our data suck and something's wrong with that. I, we did the best we can and, it, and, and you know, we, we've talked to a lot of people and shared it with them and no one is pointing to any single number that they think is wrong in, the, in terms of our calculations and the, and the assumptions we're making. So you know, we, we do think it's in somewhere else. It's about own produced milk, it's about labor markets. It's about illiquid savings. Uh, one related question is, why are you expecting the labor market to be any better? Because I, I come from India, and there a village woman would prefer to stay at home and have a cow in her backyard to milk, uh, rather than go out and carry bricks in the hot sun. So there might be. Uh, well, there's things other than carrying bricks in the hot sun. So I mean, there's. It's not just two things for them to do. But the point is, if they're her true market wage is zero, that tells us that there's a real problem in labor markets. And that does solve the cow problem, mm -hmm. or the cow puzzle, but it then should be telling us we gotta figure out something going on in this labor market. What is going on that her next best, her next best alternative is zero? Mm -hmm. That's a depressing thought. It is, and I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, my question's a little different. I'm more coming from the psychological aspect. I had a question. Um, your intervention seemed to me more um, extrinsically motivated, dealing more with stimulus control. Do you, could, do you foresee that being a problem in terms of developing autonomy? Or um, I guess it's a, more, a sense of independence and more creativity in terms of any of these different, um, you know, there's mo the money aspect. There's also, as you said, weight loss. Can you comment on that? So, um, so I think the, so at the end of the day, it's an empirical question. And it's, a, it's a great question to ask, because you know, if you have extrinsic motivation for something, do, do habits form and things continue? So I can, all, the best I could do to that is tell you about the data I'm aware of, because um, I completely agree it's the right question to be asking, and you know, we don't know until we see data. On smoking, the one study that I've been involved in was in the Philippines, uh, where we gave people commitment contracts to stop smoking, uh, tested them at six months, it was great, very successful, but then went back six months after the contract, it was over, so now there's no more outside stimulus in that sense, 
and the treatment effect was still there. They were 30 percentage points more likely to not be smoking compared to the control group. Um, exercise, there was a study done in, among undergrads in somewhere in California that paid, paid them to go exercise and then followed them for about three, six months afterwards and found that the treatment effect continued and they created the habit of exercise and, and they were still exercising. Weight loss, no. The studies I've seen on weight loss so far, though they're still out there, is, you know, it doesn't you know, wait. But the truth is nothing on weight loss has ever worked <laughs> after the initial weight is lost. Like, you have never seen anything that shows anything other than bouncing back. Um, and, you know, and it certainly fits for my life, too. <laughs> I'm always going like this. Thank you. I'm from Kenya, and yes, we, we just don't eat the, the green beans. <laughs> we, we prefer the, the bean itself, but not the pod. So yeah, I totally agree with you on that. Um, I'd like for you to just speculate a little bit about uh, what you see as the future of microcredit, uh, microfinance. Uh, and particularly, I'm interested in, um, in just you talking a little bit about uh, uh, the fact that for over 40 years, do you feel that people really gave, gave all that uh, a free pass without having to really look into what was going on? And then all of a sudden, as uh, uh, everybody's looking into it and, and, and realizing that there were some things probably that should have been uh, paid more attention to then. And with that, just where, where do you see the future of, of that? So, so first of all, I, I would say they gave it a free pass, but they gave everything a free pass. I mean, you, we just weren't seeing this type of rigorous evaluation being done in development in general. It wasn't just microcredit that was getting a free pass. It was, it was education programs, and it was health programs. It was across the space. Um, and, and that's not that it was, I don't want to say there was zero, but it was just not, um, it, it was not as common by any means. Um, the future of microfinance, I think, is heading in, in there's, I'd, I'd say there's two basic patterns that I, I see happening in a lot of contexts. One is there's clearly a shift from the nonprofit to the for-profit space. And I think of this as a healthy, space, healthy shift, personally, um, that think about the nonprofit basically subsidized through donor money the innovation phase, the research and development phase of figuring out how to do this. But it turns out it's actually profitable to lend to most of the poor, not all of the poor. The ultra poor still is a, is a separate issue, so I'll get to that in a second. But it turns out it's, it's, and you can actually do it profitably. Um, in most places where I see nonprofits and for-profits lending side by side, they don't charge different interest rates. They're just structured differently. So let the for-profits do it. They can bring in investor money and give them a return. You don't need the donor money. And put the donor money to things that actually require subsidies. Right? That's the way the world should work. We subsidize the things that need subsidies, and we don't subsidize things that don't. So one of the larger micro lenders, for instance, that I know in the United States, um, Unitas, uh, basically saw the impact studies come out and saw two things happen. Saw impact studies come out, which made them scratch their head and say, wow, we're not, we're not actually like, doing massive amounts to alleviate poverty. We're making some people better off, but this is not the, the kind of the poster child silver bullet that we'd been pretending. And the second thing they noticed is they kept finding themselves in the room Try, talking to lenders, offering them money, grants, donations to do their lending, while next to them was a um, um, was an investor, offering them an investment, and they kind of sort of seemed themselves. Wait a second, what are we doing here? <laughs> Why are we giving away money to people who are perfectly happy to borrow it, but but prefer my money, prefer it free to have to pay it back? So they'll take our grant money. But if we don't give them grant money, they'll just borrow, take equity from these other people. And so what are we doing? And so they got out. And they put their money into other things. They took their entire pot of money that they had been donating and, and doing investments in microcredit. And they moved into areas where they saw there was actually um, a real niche, a real, real um, capital was not being moved into. It was more, more venture type of approaches. So we're seeing that shift to for profit. That's one shift. The other shift that we're seeing is a more expansive set of products. We're seeing that lenders realize it's not just about lending. Maybe it's about savings. Maybe it's about insurance. Um, and also, 
seeing a shift towards recognizing that microcredit in its current model very rarely reaches the ultra poor. There's a set of people that are so poor that they are not qualified for microcredit loans, and what do you do there? And there's a group of, that are working in that tranche um, to figure out, okay, maybe we just need to give grants. Maybe, you know, the idea of giving someone a loan who's that poor is, doesn't make any sense because they don't have the experience, and in many cases they're not willing to take on the risk of a loan. And so grants are actually going to be more effective. And so there's a, there's a push underway to do that too. curious to know what your opinion was on how much involvement we should have from the government in terms of policy development to address the market failures and at what point does that become do we cross the line of diminishing returns where the costs of overseeing and monitoring the policies actually diminish the benefits that they're intended to provide so the first just depends on the context depends on the market problem right so there's many problems let's take let's take financial markets for the most part it seems to me clear that you know letting 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 lenders do their thing is a good thing, and getting out of the way is good. Except there are some issues with like just things like disclosure policy and things like that that need that do need to, some watching. But for the most part, that's an area where the, the government shouldn't be you know should basically be acting by not acting. Um, but there's certainly other areas where the government is exactly the right vehicle to be doing something through. So one of the things that, and you know, basically anything you need to do at scale, frankly, that isn't inherently a business solution needs government, right? So if it can be done at scale but in a profitable way, then fine, the for-profits will come in and do it. Just free them up to do that. But let's take something that's actually in the education space. That's not, you're not gonna find for-profits that are gonna go off and do this. So as an example, uh, at IPA, one of the things, two of the things that we're scaling up one is an approach to remedial education that we've tested in three different locations, found to be successful, but you know, that needs to be done through the government. It's, we're talking about primary school education and how it improve it. Another example is deworming. Deworming school children turned out to be the most cost-effective way of increasing school attendance, much more so than doing things like paying the kids to go to school. The people were, who had intestinal worms, kids who had intestinal worms were sick and unhealthy and then didn't go to school when they were having intestinal worms. A 25 cent pill is all it takes. The other kicker about deworming is that if I get a deworming pill, the kid next to me is better off too because I don't pass worms to him. And the worms get passed in the playground from foot to foot, basically. So there's externalities. That's a market failure. And that says that if everybody's acting rationally and privately, we might see too little deworming. That's exactly when you want the government to step in subsidize something, it's just a contagious disease. There's, you know, this is like Econ 101 says when there's contagious diseases, there's a public health cause to come in and subsidize things because everybody acting rationally doesn't take into account their externalities on everybody else, right? And so that's a perfect example where the right implementing agency is the government. Come in and blanket the place and do it. And that's basically when, you know, IPA has now led the deworming of something in the order of 20 to 30 million children. Um, but we do it by going into the country or in the case of India, a state. It's the same thing as a country. Um, so we did the state of Bihar. Um, and, um, and that's the right way of doing it. You don't want to just go into one school with, with $100. You want to go to the entire country with $5 million and do everybody. I didn't answer your second question. Okay, that was actually our last question. So if you guys would help me in uh, thanking yeah. Dean one Thank last time. Thank you, everyone. Time. And I would invite everyone to, um, he will be here after uh, to answer any more questions. And we also have refreshments in the back. So thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much.